So today's topic is hedging the weakening ringgit and securing your financial goals. So we'll go to the first one, which is gold, right? The go to precious metals, uh, and of course, Asians' favorite Chinese metal as well. So I think back then, in our parents' days, or even in our grandparents' days, um, some of them actually are gold holders, right? They will actually buy up a lot of gold um, from their point of time back then uh, to be used as um, gifts uh, during weddings or also as a form of um, investment as well, right? So it is also considered an effective hedge from a fund manager uh, venture capital point of view. So not only Asians buy gold, but even the big hedge funds, venture capital, uh, they would also you know, consider go uh, at certain periods of economic time, right? And the good thing about it, right off today, you don't need to go after go bouillon, right? You don't need to buy one kg, uh, which can be out of reach for most of us. You can buy as little as a few grams to kickstart. And you don't also need to buy physical gold as well. I think plenty of the banks offer you um, gold certificates, which is you buy an ownership uh, of uh, some of the gold sitting in the bank's um, vault or etc. And yeah, that would be the paper gold, uh, which is the gold investment schemes offered by banks. Right? So it is very flexible these days compared to back then, where you need to actually physically hold on to gold. And uh, if you look at the gold prices on the left hand side, uh, where gold is denominated uh, back to the uh, Malaysia ringgit, you can see that 1996 it was below 2000 ringgit per ounce and uh, coming to uh, today, it is uh, hitting or going to the 10,000 ringgit per ounce uh, level. Uh, you might be saying that then it's a no-brainer to actually, you know, uh, chuck my current hard-earned savings into gold. And uh, as we all know, gold uh, wouldn't depreciate as and gold would probably hold its value uh, indefinitely because of historical times. Um, and of course, of its utility as well. And uh, it would always be the precious metal uh, that humans will want to fall back to in case of any uncertainty. But if you look at the uh, price differences against the US dollar, right, back in 1994, it was just below 500 US dollars per ounce. But fast forward to today, it's uh, 2000 US dollars. So the appreciation from a US dollar point of view isn't that much compared to the ringgit. So you can, from here, uh, tie back that, um, yes, gold has appreciated, but due to the de depreciation of the ringgit, you can see that the price, uh, when denominated ringgit, the uh, appreciation value goes up faster. But if you actually benchmark it against a strong currency like the US dollar, yeah, the appreciation value hasn't gone up that much. And if you look at uh, just purely 2019 until um, today, I think the value the quantum of it is much lesser compared to um, the ringgit Malaysia, right? So this is something to take note of. You are doing something if you're buying gold, but it is not um, the absolute way of uh, preserving and, and hedging the weakening ringgit. And some of the points to take note of, if you do uh, want to consider gold, uh, it is not an income generating asset. It is an asset, right? It will preserve your net worth. It will not depreciate like the ringgit. It will hold its value uh, if humans do not find another precious metal or precious um, instrument to, to, to fall back on as a safe haven asset. And um, it can only hedge, as I said, a weakened currency. It cannot generate returns, so it won't pay you dividends. It won't generate cash and put it into your account. It will stay there and the value will just go up because of the, of the uh, relative um, depreciation against uh, the major currencies. And um, if you want to actually get the best value out of gold, it's not true jewelry, right? It's from um, gold coins or gold bullion itself because there is going to be a markup uh, for jewelers to, you know, form and, and shape uh, gold into jewelry, be it necklace, uh, rings, etc. So there will, there will always be a markup. And if you sell back your gold ring or your gold chain to the jeweler, uh, they'll also buy it back at a discount. So chances are if you invest it in the form of a jewelry, you might not even get uh, appreciation even 20, 30 years down the road. Right? So this is something you need to take note of. And you need to also visit the, the, the goldsmith to understand how the, the goldsmith make business model work. So this is something I just found out uh, when I went to the goldsmith. So don't do it by a jewelry. If you want it, buy either gold bar or gold bullion or gold coin. And one other concern that I have is, is that the small grimages are also not so worth it. Right? You can say that I'll start small, I'll buy one gram, one gram, one gram at a time. But 
even if you buy one gram, the markup is also much higher compared to um, the gold bar format. So you are actually losing out if you start small. Uh, even though um, it is flexible, the barrier of entry is easier, but you're actually losing out if you actually start small. So this is something to take note of. It's not that uh, it will totally put off your approach to start small, but you would actually be paying much more uh, markup if you start by buying the small gramage. So, so next we have uh, foreign currency. So this is something that maybe um, most of us are a little bit hesitant, right? but I think um, those of the younger generation or my generations, we are much more receptive towards it. Even me, myself, I am very much re uh, receptive into uh, looking to holding uh, foreign currencies as a potential uh, divestment or, 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 or I would say diversification, right? So back then you can say that uh, it's so hard to secure foreign currencies. But I think today, Malaysian banks and even the foreign banks in Malaysia, they are offering multi-currency accounts. So it basically that you open a multi-currency account with a particular bank, and then you can buy GBP, Japanese yen, US dollar, et cetera. A lot of bank, different banks will have different choices uh, offered in terms of currencies. And uh, it's very easy. Some, some of it can be done just by uh, clicking and tapping on the app, right? And the key concern, I would say obstacles, would some of the uh, would require you to have a deposit of 10,000 ringgit, which I think is a small, small uh, hurdle, right? And um, I think the good thing about having access to a multi-currency account is that you can treat it as a savings account for your vacation plan. So say something like you are planning for a vacation to Japan, right? One year, in, in one year's time. So this year, you're not able to enjoy the autumn scenery, but you think that, ah, next year, I would probably have enough savings to do so. But you are concerned that what if um, the ringgit continues to weaken against the Japanese, and which is not right now, but you never know what will happen in one year's time. So if you think today's rate is really, really decent, yeah, just open a multi-currency account, convert the ringgit into Japanese, and lock in the rate. And um, come next year, same period, you, you will not be... Uh, having this webinar, probably you're, you're going to be in Japan uh, enjoying the, the autumn scenery. So don't wait until last minute where uncertainty in the exchange rates can derail or you know even make you spend more just because you didn't have the facility to hold on to a foreign currency. Right? So you can do that pre-plan, uh, top up uh, on a monthly basis or lump sum basis at your discretion without getting affected by the beginning of it. So these are some of the banks that are offering or financial institutions that are offering um, foreign currency, multi-currency uh, account. So you have Public Bank, RHB, Hong Kong Bank, HSBC, Maybank. And you also have Vice, which I'm personally using. So I don't think there is much, I would say, obstacle. You, you're not tied to potentially just a few choices. There are so many choices out there. You just need to touch base with the particular bank that you are currently banking with and ask them in more detail. Okay, I want to know more about your multi-currency account. How does it work? Um, what must I must what must I do, and get everything open and sorted, right? So it's up to your discretion to open your multi currency account, and potentially hedge away from the beginning again, right? Small, small, very easy attainable steps. And uh, of course, points to also take note when you want to go down the foreign currency uh, path to diversify your net worth, and the most important one would be to assuming the Western currencies in the like of the US dollar, the Great Britain pound, and also the Euro are strongest by default, right? So of course, US dollar has been very strong when the Feds were you know, increasing and hiking up the rates. But as of lately, after the pause hiking, you can see that the US dollar actually weakened quite a bit. Singaporeans uh, or Malaysians who are working in Singapore, uh, who monitor the US dollar and the Sing dollar rate, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the Sing dollar actually appreciated against the, Sing, uh, the US dollar. So if you, go all, if you go all in, you will be caught uh, when the um, federal um, institutions uh, or, the, or the feds in this case change their monetary stance. Uh, the same goes if um, the Sing Singapore um, Monetary Authority also change their stance on the, on, the, on the Sing dollar as well. So don't go assuming that they will become strongest. They will get affected, but um, you don't want to be caught in an unwanted situations where you top up uh, everything and uh, you lose because of the weakening uh, after something happened. So everything will always have their up and down, right? And uh, I don't personally advocate forex trading, but if you do have an interest interest in it, do pursue it uh, at your own discretion. And uh, when you go down that road, be aware that speculating is not the same as hedging. Uh, 
um, at the right quantity. So the message here is to prepare, plan for whatever that you can afford to lose or to prepare for, say for example, a vacation somewhere down the road, but not you know chucking everything into a particular currency just because it is a strong currency by default. So things to take note of uh, if you want to look into uh, FX as a kind of way to diversify. Then we have stocks. So this is personally, in my opinion, the best asset class to hedge depreciation of cash. Regardless of the ringgit, regardless of the US dollar, regardless of sing dollar, I think personally stocks are the best way to hedge against anything that can depreciate. But we must all be um, aware that stock picking is, I would say hard, right? I might change my stance right now uh, as I was uh, preparing the deck. It has its own set of challenges. And to some people, it is troublesome, but to me, it is exciting, right? But if it's hard and troublesome to you, you can always opt for an index ETF. We will talk more about that later, what is an index ETF. And to me, you need to do well in um, a few aspects, right? You probably need to be very good in um, differentiating a good company from a lousy company. And uh, once you found a good company, I think you just need to be patient about it, right? So find good companies, be patient about it. I think you're 50% uh, well prepared for success, right? So you need to know the consistency uh, and the facts about the market, what is happening. You also need to be kept abreast of um, the latest uh, you know, uh, news and also developments about the world. So if you have the passion and the interest to do so, then yeah, it would be much easier for you. So if I were to take a step back and tabulate the performance of S&P 500 against gold, which we saw back then was amazing, right? For the past 10 years, 20 years against the ringgit, right? But back then when you see that how gold has appreciated against the, the ringgit, and now that I compare gold against the S&P 500, you can see that there is a stark difference in terms of performance. So if, imagine if I were to just also draw a line that represents the ringgit measure, how high has the S&P 500 appreciated against gold and against the ringgit, right? In this time frame, uh, which is I think 2010, February until today. So I think in, the, in just less than um, 15 years old, to be exact, 13 years, 2010 to 2023, uh, you would be actually sitting on close to 300% in terms of um, returns generated, right? Every dollar, every ringgit um, invested back then would be 300% in 13 years. And if I were to add the local Malaysia, USA, um, the KLCI index, right? You can see that um, even gold has appreciated much more against the USA Malaysia. And uh, this would take us into the next um, sub-segment of the stocks uh, as a way to you know, diversify your holdings is that, do you want to actually look into Busan Malaysia stocks? Or do you want to you know, look into diversifying into the US where you can see that there is a um, clear cut track record of how the US market is outperforming against um, our KLCI and also gold. So for those who think that stock picking is hard, it takes up time, you don't have interest in it, but you still want to write on the long-term returns of the index. Yeah, here are some key considerations for you to uh, take note of. Yeah, you can either take a photo of it, write it down. Also, we talk about the S&P 500, so there are many choices as well, but um, uh, they basically have almost identical returns uh, over the long-term period. So you can actually uh, search up for Vanguard S&P 500 ETF, BOO, so stock ticker, uh, SPDR, S&P 500 Trust, SPY, or you can also opt for the iShares Core S&P 500 ETF, IBB. So it doesn't matter uh, which platform or which brokerage you're using, these codes are, are universal. You just need to search for BOO, SPY, or IBB uh, at your preferred um, investment brokerage account, and you actually be directed to these ETFs. And at your discretion, uh, if you do think that S&P 500 continue to grow at the healthy rate of return, yeah, these are the ETFs for you to consider. If you're someone who is looking for much higher returns, but can also tolerate uh, higher volatility, 
you can actually consider the investor QQQ trust, which is uh, the index or ETF tracking the NASDAQ, uh, which constitutes more towards your Magnificent 7 stocks, your Meta, Microsoft, Tesla, ETC. So these stocks have been phenomenal uh, for the past few years, even though there has been a sell down in 2022. But if we just ignore, or if we just look at everything from a long, longer term time frame, say for the past five years, 10 years, QQQ has gone up much more than S&P 500 when you thought that S&P 500 has gone up a lot. So this is something you might need to consider, but it also is more volatile. The sell-off might need, might, will definitely be more brutal compared to S&P 500. So if you can some, you're someone who can take volatility, but don't want to stop it, then you can look at QQQ. And um, yeah, you can actually DIY or do very, um, consistent DCA, dollar cost averaging. So set aside a few hundred bucks or a few thousand ringgit every month and just diligently pour into it. Like buy every month. Even if it goes down, buy. Even if it goes up, buy. You must be consistent. Don't do it just for three months and stop doing it. You have to do it for three years, four years, five years for you to get uh, the kind of returns that you are seeing right here. So when the market is down, you continue to buy. Probably you will go up more when the market will rebounds. Right? And even if it peaks, the average price that you are they have been buying when the market was low will also average it down. So you're not going to get, you know, draw down as much as the index itself if there is a market correction. Something you need to really understand when it comes to DCA is that if you do it consistently, you won't get hurt badly and you might even get the opportunity to participate when the market rallies or recovers. Okay. 